Okay, so we're getting into the last two kind of housekeeping weeks of the semester. So um, for next time, remember you're reading about the next 200 pages of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, and you're going to finish your annotated bibliography, right? Um, also, I want everybody to know that course evaluations are now up on Georgia View. You should have got an email in your radar account about this. Um, I do want to encourage everybody to do this because it does actually help shape the way the class will look in the future, right? Um, you know, just you know, be honest about your impressions, um, what you liked, what you didn't like, um, because you know it's not going to get me fired or punished or in trouble, right? It's just going to help me make the class better for future uh, semesters. Um, and also, uh, Dale, you will be doing the world building stuff for next time, right now. Do you have enough material from her, from Carrington to do this? Gonna, I have her number. I was going to text her today. Okay. Her okay. And um, just like I will be taking into account that she hasn't been present, and you know that you're just going to be doing the best you can with what you have. So. Yeah, I'll just. That's what she did. She texted me asking for lunch, so I so Okay. I was just going to text her today because I'm pretty sure I have to go. Okay. Great. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, Bethany. Um, are we just supposed to be drawing, doing a sketch of the character you assigned us, or like what? <laughs> okay, so so what, what what we'll do, and this this is again, this is voluntary, right? You don't have to participate if you don't want to. But I was gonna run a quick Dungeons and Dragons game for you with the characters. Um, of you know the different you know races that you designed in the world that you all designed together, so it would prob the game would probably take um, we'd probably schedule it sometime during finals week, maybe a little break that people can take. Um, the game would probably take about two or three hours. So again, voluntary. You don't have to participate if you don't want to, but it would be a kind of like I think it would be kind of neat to see how this you know world that you all made holds up. That kind of actual storytelling setting. Like, can you name a specific date we'll be doing this? We'll have to figure this out mutually. So, what, why don't we? Uh, why don't I send everybody like a when is good poll, and we'll get something figured out um, then. Um, speaking of, I also do want to kind of nail down um, a time or a time and day to do a review session with all of you um, for the final exam. So our final exam is on Monday the 13th, right? Yeah, at 1030. Yeah. So I think that gives us um, Thursday or Friday to do a review session. Yeah, great. Is it going to be on every weekly bread or just this, this half? It is going to be cumulative. It is going to be cumulative, right? So it's going to cover everything. Okay. Um, but what I will do, right, in addition to the review session and the sample questions I've already given you all, um, I will give you, I'll go back through the vocab quizzes, and I will give you a list of terms that may actually appear on the exam, right? Because some of the, I feel like some of them I think it's more important for you to know going forward than others. Um, so yeah, I will isolate the ones that I think are actually important for you to know that I want you to have down for the exam, and uh, that'll help make things a little easier. I will reopen the vocabulary quizzes in particular. Like, I was going to do that anyway because people, to give people a chance to study for them, um, to go back and see, like, okay, this is what my definition was. Um, but uh, yeah, I will reopen the vocab quizzes for a short time. Um, so in terms of when we can do a review session, I have a review session already on Thursday for my Britlet 2 class. What did we say? Was it 8 to 10 we were going to do that? OK. Yeah, I think it was like 9 to 10. Yeah, maybe not right. But yeah, nine, right, yeah, I think we said like 9 to 10.30 or something like that, yeah. So um, the morning. Um, is kind of taken up from anything. I'm also, I'm also administering an exam to somebody from uh, who can't be there for the actual date of the final from one to three. So I'm not available 
at those times on Thursday. Are there other times on Thursday when all of you would be available? Thursday's not a good day for you? No, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, I'm working. Yeah, I work Thursday. Okay. And I've already asked, requested some days off, like two or three days off just to be fine. Okay. I gotta move up those times either. Okay. Would you be open to, like, a virtual? We could do a virtual review session. Yeah, there's, there's no reason why we couldn't, yeah. So is there a time maybe on Friday that we could do that? Like this Friday? No, not this Friday. Okay. Uh, next week. No, I mean, after, we're all, after we're actually done with the course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that be, um, That's Friday. That's the final. No, the 10th. Yeah. Okay. Can I see what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. I work until 6 30 on Friday. Okay, so you work until 6 30. Like the one person that is not available. But if you do it on Blackboard Creative, you can record it. And right. She can go back and watch it even if she's Yeah. Because that's what I mean, I would love to work. That's what a lot of my friends are doing. Okay. Okay. My work schedule is jam-packed. I probably wouldn't be able to make it to anything even if we scheduled it. So if it's if it's recorded, I'll definitely watch it. Okay, but I I, I think it still needs to, um, there need to be enough of you there <laughs> that I know what questions you have too. Um. So to, you know. Um. Actually, here here's the thing we can do maybe. Why don't y'all submit questions that you have via email? Um, by Friday, by that Friday morning, and then I will record answers to your questions, and we'll do that as the review session, um, and we'll post it to the lecture video section in Georgia View. Are you going to post everyone's questions so we can watch everyone's? Yes, okay. yes. I'll, I'll, I'll just end. You know, I, you know, they'll, they'll you know, I, I don't have to say who asked what right. question, right? It's like, okay, the, you know, I, I got this, you know. This question, okay, this is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that actually, that means that I don't actually have to do quite as much, think, much thinking on the fly either, which is probably good. <laughs> I can more carefully consider how I answer your questions. <laughs> okay, so I somehow managed to mix up my papers for the, this uh -huh. class and for it lit. We're okay. only doing one work for this class, right? Yes, just one for this work, and it's a comparative paper for Britley too. Yep. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're good. Okay. Any other questions about anything before we move on? Okay. Great. Then let's actually. Um, well, let's. I want to leave this question up for a minute because I, I do kind of want to start delving into things here. But if I first, first I want to do the usual thing to kind of get your general impressions of how this is going for you, what you think. What's, what do you like about it? What's hard about it? They, I've noticed uh, a few times in the story, I like thought I skipped some pages because they would present a situation. Uh-huh. Uh, they would present a situation like um, when Ms. Uh, Warm, what's her name? The lady who married the guy who came back from the dead. What's her name? I okay, Miss Wintertown, right? Yes. Who then becomes Lady Pole. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. So when she um, died, and uh -huh. the, the weird fairy man was like, uh, I'll, I'll take this instead. And then I got to the next page, and I uh -huh. was like, what did you take? I didn't know. And then I found out later in the story that it was a finger. That happened a few times in the story. I thought that was kind of cool. It was like okay. suspenseful. And then you find out. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of delayed payoff. Here, yeah, right? it like jumps from uh -huh. the story. Okay. 
people. And, um, anything else that you guys are finding interesting or difficult? Um, the spelling of some words is interesting. Okay. Like, um, surprise. Surprise <laughs> is spelled with a Z. Uh huh. Or I know that it's supposed to say showed, but shoot. Shoot, okay. And so, um, that's interesting, but then it's also, I'm going to have to reread a couple of those lines a few times. Right. Times. What? Oh, okay, that's what they're saying. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah, and I, of course, I mean, I think, like, y'all are probably used to, sufficiently used to, like, standard British spellings right by now as opposed to standard American spellings. But what's going on here is that what Clark is, what Clark is doing is mimicking a lot of the conventions of the 19th century novel, right? Particularly the novel of the Romantic period. So, you know, think, you know, stuff like Jane Austen, right? Um, and so what she's, one of the things that she's doing in order to uh, create that kind of verisimilitude is, you know, she's imitating the spellings and standard language of that period rather than writing it in contemporary language, right? Can we, can we think of other things that make this look like it's meant to belong, that, that she's doing to make, make it look like it's meant to belong, like in that early 19th century period, rather than to say like a modern work describing that period. What else makes this look like it belongs to the 19th century? All the footnotes. <laughs> oh yeah, lots of footnotes, right? I do like the footnotes. Uh-huh. Long time. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like one page where it's like, yeah, all the there's this much of a story, uh -huh. and then like the rest of the page is a footnote. Yeah, and the thing, so one of the things, there are a couple of things about the footnotes, right? One of the things to note about the footnotes is that they are, they're not necessarily explanatory, right? They're actually part of the narrative, part of the story. And sometimes they're more important to the narrative than what's going on up above, right? Particularly, you know, for example, there are a couple examples like where Mr. Norrell is explaining something, right? And one of Norrell's particular talents seems to be to make something as interesting as magic boring. Um, so the footnotes will often be like a, a kind of entertaining story that's a kind of counterpoint to Mr. Norrell's boring and rambling explanation. Um, the other thing that they're, they're doing here, like, so most of the books that are referenced in the footnotes are not real, right? So for example, you know, um, I think the first footnote references The History and Practice of English Magic by Jonathan Strange, Volume 1, Chapter 2, published by John Murray, London, 1816, right? <laughs> okay, well, why did it be, did it, why did that confuse you, Grace? Because normally footnotes are like making or like stating like something that's like true. Or yeah. Real. Uh huh. So I think it's. I mean, I guess it's interesting that she would do that. That's like a little texture. Yeah. Exactly. It, it is about adding texture, right? Making making the world like the secondary world that this creates seem more real, yeah. right? Yeah, like so it gives this fake book the air of authority, right? So this is a, the history of, you know, the history and practice of English magic is not a real book in our world, right? But in the world that Clark sets up here, it is. And, you know, these other books that are cited, you know, like, you know, The Language of Birds by Thomas Lanchester and things like that, right? These are all made up. They're all fake. But <clears throat> what's the primary difference between Clark's early 19th century and our version of the early 19th century? Those magicians? Yeah. <laughs> There's magic, right? There are magicians, at least two of them. Although we do see other people who are not strange and normal practicing, you know, uh, normal servant childrenness, for example, seem to at least know a few spells. Um, but yeah, the, the, the primary difference between this, 
19th century England and our 19th century England is the presence of magic. And is the presence of magic here something that is completely new or unexpected or novel to people in this world? Yeah, it's been gone for a while, right? But it seems to be acknowledged by everyone that magic used to exist, right? So magic exists in this world as an, an acknowledged historical fact and also as part of general common knowledge. What were you going to say, Ashlyn? Well, it's, it's actually practiced magic is viewed as, you know, lowbrow, low uh -huh. noble to study the history. Yeah, we have, uh, at least in this first chapter, right, we're told that most, that really all, mu all magicians in England by the 18th century are purely theoretical magicians, right? Um, at the very first page here, right, you know, the first chapter, the library of the curfew. Can I get somebody uh, to start uh, reading from some years ago there was in the city of York? Some years ago there was in the city of York a society of magicians. They met upon the third Wednesday of every month and read each other long, dull papers upon the history of English magic. They were gentlemen magicians, which is to say they had never harmed anyone by magic, nor ever done anyone the slightest good. In fact, to own the truth, not one of these magicians had ever cast the smallest spell, nor by magic caused one leaf to tremble upon a tree, made one mote of dust to alter its course, or changed a single hair upon anyone's head. But with this one minor reservation, they enjoyed a reputation as some of the wisest and most magical gentlemen in Yorkshire. Okay, thank you. So this phrase, gentlemen magicians, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a gentleman? What's that? To have an education and to have some kind of status. Yeah, it's more about status than education, right? A gentleman is um, essentially an upper class person, right? upper middle to upper class. So yeah, it's more um, a comment on someone's class status um, than it is on anyone else about them, right? So to do magic, particularly to do certain kinds of magic, is vulgar, right? And we see some of these prejudices in Norrell himself, right? For example, do we notice particular forms of magic that Norrell seems to be prejudiced against? tricks, right? He yeah. hates street magicians yeah. right. and regards them as charlatans, right? And, you know, to be fair, like, you know, they are. They don't do real magic. You know, people like Vinculus, he just, he hates with, uh, with a fiery burning passion. But <clears throat> what other kinds of, ma like, apart from kind of silly or trivial magic, what kind, what other kinds of magic does Mr. Norrell seem to hate? Magic for personal gain. Okay, for personal gain, although he certainly uses magic to gain influence with Sir Walter Pole, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, he breaks one of his own major rules in order to do so. Which of his personal rules does he break in order to get Sir Walter's favor? Yeah. Bringing Lady Pole back 
<laughs> yeah. Using the dead to life. Yes, bringing the dead to life, okay. right? Now this is something that in principle, Noro himself might not actually be opposed to. The problem, the way, the way he breaks his own rules, is the way he does it. What does he have to use to do this? He has to use fairy magic, yes. He is very much opposed to the use of fairies or the summoning of fairies in order to perform magical feats, right? And he tends to generally deny that this is how magic should be done. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the quiz question that I asked you all here about the feat of magic that he performs, I think that there, is, there are a lot of kind of inherent contradictions and ironies in um, Norrell's basic position on magic. Um, what's the thing that he does in your cathedral that proves his power? Yeah, he, all of the statues in the cathedral come to life, right? What's that? Yeah, it's, he, he can't keep it quite confined to the cathedral. It spreads out. Um, almost kind of like demonstrating like that this one act of magic in York, right? Starts spreading magic outward from its source. Um, to other places. And what do we, does he, see, does he seem to control what the statues are saying? Yeah, the, the statues seem to have their own, their own voices, right? And their own experiences. Like if we look on page 32, Can we start with this italicized passage here, which is the, the first thing that uh, the, um, <clears throat> the magicians listening or experiencing this are able to uh, wrap their minds around. Uh, can I get somebody to start reading from long, long ago, said the voice. said the voice 500 years ago or more on a winter's day at twilight a young man entered the church with a young girl with ivy leaves in her hand there was no one else there but the stones no one to see him strengthen her but the stones he let her fall dead upon the stones and no one saw but the stones he was never punished for his sin because there, was, there were no witnesses but the stones the, <clears throat> the years went by and whenever the man entered the church and stood among the congregation, the stones cried out that this was the man who had murdered the girl with the ivy leaves wound in her hair. But no one ever heard us. It is not too late. We know where he's buried, in the corner of the south transept. Quick, quick, fetch pits, fetch shovels, pull up the paving stones, dig up his bones, let them be smashed with a shovel, dash his skull against the pillars and break it. Let the stones have vengeance too. It is not too late. It is not too late. Okay, thank you. So what is this? this speech spoken by one of these statues tell us about the stones in the church, about the statues in the church. They see everything and they remember everything. Yeah, that they actually have their own, like inanimate objects have their own inner lives here, right? They have their own perceptions. So what then does magic give to them? What's the only thing magic can give to the statues? Animation. Yeah, animation, right? It can, it can give them the power to move, and also, perhaps more importantly, to do what? Yeah, to speak, 
right? So the stones can perceive without the aid of magic. But unless assisted by magic, they are voiceless. So this, I would argue, assumes a certain kind of relationship between the magician and nature, right? That the magician, rather than uh, being someone who exerts control over the natural world, is someone who gives the natural world the means to express its independent perceptions and its own kind of inner world and inner life, right? But I don't think that Norrell himself actually recognizes this, right? Because what kind of sense do we get of Mr. Norrell as a personality thus far? What's he like? He's like the, I feel like he's like the old guy who would yell at the kid for grabbing their soccer ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm like. He's Smaug. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's, why, why, would you, why would you compare him to Smaug, Ashlyn? Because he's, he's hoarding all of his knowledge. Okay. And, you know, every time Mr. Segundas or Mr. Honey is like, take a book off and flip through it, like, oh my gosh, that uh -huh. was so amazing. He's like, please, it's nothing, it's, it's trash. Uh huh. But then it's like, if it's trash, why are you hoarding it? Yeah, he doesn't like to, like, even books that he thinks are trash, he doesn't like to let other people touch, right? And he has lovingly rebound all of these ancient volumes that are falling apart, right? Even ones that are written on pub tabs. Yeah. And I think there's an interesting comparison there between um, some, of these, some of these books of magic and his servant Childerness's cards. Um, but we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll sort of hit on that in a minute. Um, but yeah, so he hoards knowledge. He hoards books. And does Norrell want there to be other magicians? No. Yeah, he wants to be the only one, right? He wants total control over what English magic looks like, right? What English magic is. He wants to make magic, as he says, respectable. Right. Not something that people laugh at or regard as you know, trivial or, um, or even particularly marvelous, right? Things that are respectable are, on the whole, pretty dull. When you look at the very first little picture, <laughs> it's of Mr. Norrell, I believe. It says he hardly ever spoke of magic, and when he did, it was like a history lesson, and no one could bear to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, Norrell himself is not a very interesting person. And he's grasping in secretive, right? So, like, for example, the second part of the question here, right? What does he force the learned society of York magicians to do in order to witness his miracle? Is that a document that uh, disbands them and tells them that they can no longer use the title of magician? Yeah. They have to promise that they'll stay away from magic, right? that they will abandon magic if he proves that he can do it. Now, there's one guy in the group, though, that is exempted from the agreement. Mr. Segundus. Yeah, Mr. Segundus. And why do you think he lets Mr. Segundus get away with not signing it? Because he has nothing else without the magic. 
Well, I, I think he genuinely uh -huh. wants to learn. Yeah, well, Norrell doesn't give a shit about what Mr. Segundus has or doesn't, right? Yeah. But if Segundus won't sign the document, what does that indicate about him? Norrell is trying to prove that he can do magic, right? Yeah, it indicates that Segundus at least has faith in the possibility that Norrell can do magic, right? The others all sign it because they think that Norrell's full of shit, right? Yeah, sure, no problem, I'll sign this. There's no way he can act, there's no way he can do what he promises. But Segundus isn't so sure, and he's the one who from the start here has acknowledged the possibility, has been wondering, it's like, well, where did all the actual magic go, right? How come no one actually does magic anymore? Yeah. So what I was kind of confused about um, was how did they know that they were magicians if they have never done magic before? Yeah, um, well, I think it's more a matter of self-definition. <laughs> and they identified as yeah, well, they're, they're theoretical magicians who study the history okay, of magic, so like, right? Yeah. Plus, you know, there's, no, there's been no chance for them to actually learn to do magic because who's got all the books? Yeah. And Norrell believes that the only way to do magic is to learn it from books, right? So we'll see a con like a strange becomes... Uh, comes to the forefront of the story, we're going to see a contrast between their two approaches, right? But at this point, uh, Strange has barely appeared, right? He doesn't show up until near the end of this first part of the novel. And then he, he will dominate the second section of it, right? Well, with the Yorkshire magicians disbanded, Norrell can go in and grab what these books they do have. Yeah. Because they're just going to end up in the trash. Right. Whatever they do have that might be of any value, yeah. Norrell can, Norrell can snatch it. So, in addition to this kind of world-building aspect of this that we've already talked about, like, so we've got this kind of, this fantasy England, right, where magic is established historical facts, right? The existence of fairy is common knowledge and established historical facts. Um, there's another element here of uh, what we call metafiction that I think is probably worth talking about. And it has to do with changes in literary style in the early 19th century. Right, so do you all know what metafiction is? Okay. What's that? Oh, uh, kind of, yeah. I'm just thinking like metacognition is thinking about thinking. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, metafiction is fiction that is in some way about the writing of fiction, right? And this is as much a novel about writing as it is about anything. So a lot of Norrell's characteristics um, are representative of an 18th century literary movement called neoclassicism. Are any of you familiar with neoclassicism? Is this a term that any of you have heard? A couple of you are... Okay. So those of you who have heard it, what do you remember about it, if anything? <laughs> Must have really stuck. <laughs> okay, so neoclassicism, right, so as a movement, right, the key terms to understand here, right, are neo, new, and classic, 
that is referring to the Greek and Roman worlds. So the basic assumption that the neoclassicists made was that English literature or French literature, because there's a similar movement in France, um, was not in and of itself as worthy of respect or admiration as the literature of the ancient world. Because it did not have, to their minds, um, as high or lofty a pedigree, right? So neoclassicism is born out of an attempt to make English literature more like Greek or Roman classical literature. So this meant that neoclassical writers tended to write only in genres that the Greeks and Romans also used. So things like epic, tragedy, right, the pastoral elegy. The verse epistle, or the kind of verse, or letter in verse, right? The essay in verse. So everything was to be um, like based on things that you learned from books, right? Individual creativity was less valued than diligence and craft, right? When did you say this? Uh, what are all these that you about? This is um, kind of mid to late 18th century. So by the time this novel starts, 1806 or so, this would already be kind of starting to go out of fashion, right? But it would have been the fashion of the previous generation. So neoclassicists generally believed that you didn't have to be brilliant or creative to be a great poet, say, right? You just had to work at it. And that anybody could learn the rules of a particular, you know, the, the rules and the craft of verse making, right? So, rules became very, very important, right? You had to write in specific meters with specific rhyme schemes, right? Everything is rules based. <clears throat> Everything is rules based and categorized. And another key factor of neoclassicism, and this is something that maybe relates a little bit uh, less to its connection to Greek and Roman literature and more to the general atmosphere of skepticism in the Enlightenment. Does that say anti or to the anti superstition? <laughs> Ghosts, monsters, fairies, devils and demons, angels, right? Anything supernatural has no particular place in neoclassical literature, right? The primary subject of neoclassical writing is upper middle class. urban life. Right. In particular, social life. 
which is interesting in regards to Norrell in that Norrell doesn't appear to have much of a social life, right? He's not very good with people. But otherwise, a lot of his ideas and attitudes are very, very close to neoclassical literary um, objectives, right? For example, when he talks about his favorite book of magic, um, and he is the only person, apparently, who studies magic who has any respect for this particular book. Um, it's this... Uh, okay, let me see if I can find the damn thing. Because I can, of course, never find the passage when I'm actually looking for it. Right, page 64, right, he is explaining to his new associate, um, for, uh, Henry Lascelles, right? Here's the quote from the beginning of the section. Right? He hardly ever spoke of magic, and when he did it was like a history lesson, and no one could bear to listen to him. He rarely had a good word to say for any other magician, except once when he praised the magician of the last century, Francis Sutton Grove. But I thought, sir, said Mr. Lascelles, that Sutton Grove was unreadable. I have always heard that Degeneratus Artium was generally unreadable. Oh, said Mr. Noir, how it fares as an amusement for ladies and gentlemen, I do not know. But I do not think that the serious student of magic can value Sutton Grove too highly. In Sutton Grove, you will find the first attempt to define those areas of magic that the modern magician ought to study, all laid out in lists and tables. To be sure, Sutton Grove's system of classification is often erroneous. Perhaps that is what you mean by unreadable? Nevertheless, I know of no more pleasant sight in the world than a dozen or so of his lists. The student may run his eye over them and think, I know this, or I have still this to do. And there, is, and there before him is work enough for four, perhaps five years. So what does Norrell admire about Francis Sutton Grove? His organization. Yeah, that it's highly organized right? His work is very orderly, and it's in clear lists and tables, right? Now then, the footnote tells us what we're actually supposed to think about Francis Sutton Grove, right? Or what everyone else thinks about Francis Sutton Grove. Can I get somebody to read that for us? The bottom of page 64. Francis Sutton Grove. Theoretical magician, he wrote two books, De Generibus Atrium Magicarum Anglorum, 1741, and Prescriptions and Descriptions, 1749. Even Norell, or even Mr. Norell, Sutton Grove's greatest and indeed only admirer uh, for the practical magic, was ab abominably bad, and Mr. Norell's pupil, Jonathan Strange, loathed it so much that he tore his copy into pieces and fed it to a tinker's dog. Uh, uh, okay. mm -hmm. uh, Degeneratus Etrium Magicarum and Glorum was reputed to be dearest book, dre oh, dreariest book, uh -huh. in Canon of English Magic, which contains many tedious works. It was the first attempt by an Englishman to define the areas of magic that the modern magician ought to study. According to Sutton Grove, these numbered 38,945, and he listed them all under different heads. Sutton Grove foreshadows the great Mr. Norrell in one other way. None of his lists make any mention of the magic traditionally ascribed to birds or wild animals, and Sutton Grove pur purposely exudes those kinds of magic for which it is customary to employ fairies. Bring back the end. All right, so what do we learn here? One, about the general esteem in which magicians and scholars of magic hold Francis Sutton Grove. Very low. Yeah, that this, this guy's an idiot, right? But what do we also learn here about why Mr. Norrell esteems him so highly? Norrell says it's about charts and lists and tables, right? That's because he explained the magic that was required for Yeah, and wild animals, 
and basically any kind of nature magic, right? Any kind of nature magic or fairy magic is left out of Sutton Grove. And that seems to be the real reason why Mr. Norrell admires it, right? That it's magic that is divorced from, you know, these <coughs> kind of traditionally uh, <coughs> English ideas, right? And I think that that's the part of the battle here is specifically over what English magic is going to be, right? Notice that it's always, you know, magic is almost always preceded by the descriptor English. And was anybody able to grasp where English magic is supposed to start in the novel? Who, who's, who's regarded as the founding figure of English magic? has thus been referred to primarily as the Raven King. And in this alternative history, he ruled a separate kingdom in the north of England for about 300 years. So we'll talk a little bit more about this when Jonathan Strange comes uh, more into, into closer focus next time. Um, but one of the things this is playing on is a traditional cultural division, an economic division between the North and the South of England. And the North is here described as having at one point been a separate kingdom with its capital at Newcastle rather than at London that was ruled by a magician, the same magician, for 300 years. And Norrell, despite being a northerner himself, hates this guy. <clears throat> and yet also can't escape him. Right? If we look like the, you know, even like the footnotes that tell us these little anecdotes about the history of magic, right? The Raven King is almost always involved in some way. And so Norrell has come from the north to London to try to get himself involved in London society, right? And what do we make of the two uh, guides that he finds to London here? In fact, well, let's just kind of draw out here Norrell's household and hangers-on, right? So on the one hand, he starts out with his man of business, Childermas. The name Childer Childermas, by the way, this will become relevant probably later on refers in, uh, to the English name of the Feast of the Holy Innocents. That is you know, the religious feast day um, of the children killed by King Herod, right? We've got these other two hangers on that attach themselves to Norrell as well, right? Christopher Drawlight and Henry Lascelles. And what are these guys like and what do their aims seem to be? Okay. Like, obsessed with it almost. Uh huh. At first, it seemed that way, at least. But also, it seemed like he was kind of in it just for, like, 
the I met him first. <laughs> Yeah, he's claiming to be Norrell's best friend and closest confidant before he's even met him, right? Right. Yeah. Draw light is um, a superficial parasite, right? He just wants to attach himself to someone famous for the social benefits that will accrue to him as a result, right? It's in his name. Yeah, draw light, yeah. Draw attention. Whereas Lascelles is a little different in character from his friend, right? So draw light is silly, superficial, wasteful, right? Really just seems to want to get invited to good parties and get free meals. What's Lascelles like? Yeah, or at least he is able to affect an air yeah. of uncaring, right? He's a cynic. But the one thing that both of them kind of agree between themselves, right, is that they're going to control access to Mr. Norrell in order to mutually assist each other, right, and, you know, let, allowing their own stars to rise. So their own fate is closely tied to, or their own influence and power is closely tied to their ability to control access to normal. Right? Whereas Childermas is a little bit more independent, right? In fact, I mentioned uh, Childermas's cards um, a moment ago. And I think that this is actually probably a good place uh, to <clears throat> talk with him. We go to the chapter called The Cards of Marseille. So he's got a deck of tarot cards, right? If we look on page 199, right. he he's trying to get Vinculus to leave London because he bothers Mr. Norrell. Taken him, to, taken him to a bar, right? Children has called the girl to bring them some more ale. She brought it and they drank for a while longer in silence. Then Children took a pack of cards from the breast of his coat and showed them to Vinculus. The cards of Marseille. Did you ever see their like before? Often, said Vinculus, but yours are different. They are copies of a set belonging to a sailor I met in Whitby. He bought them in Genoa with the intention of using them to discover the hiding places of pirate's gold. But when he came to look at them, he found that he could not understand them. He offered to sell them to me, but I was poor and could not pay the price he asked. So we struck a bargain. I would tell him his fortune, and in return, he would lend me the cards long enough to make copies. Unfortunately, his ship set sail before I was able to complete the drawings, and so half are done from memory. So what does this tell us about Children Miss's magic deck here, about his deck of tarot cards? What's weird about them? Yeah. They're homemade, right? And as a result, what else then is kind of strange about them? Right, Vinculus notes that they look different from the usual deck, right? Yeah, so they're homemade, they're kind of personalized, right? They're idiosyncratic. No one else has a deck quite like children's. Now there's another thing that's weird about <coughs> Childermas's deck, right? If you look on page 200, right? It seems that when Childermas had made the bargain with the dead sailor, he had been too poor even to afford paper. 
And so the cards were drawn upon the backs of alehouse bills, laundry lists, letters, old accounts, and playbills. At a later date, he had pasted the papers onto colored cardboard, but in several instances, the printing or writing on the other side showed through, giving them an odd look. So some of Norrell, we already saw that some of Norrell's uh, spell books are kind of written in this nature as, as well, right? On like whatever paper came to hand. But this is an example of what's called a palimpsest. Does anybody know what a palimpsest is? Um, on top of the manuscript. Yeah, it's when yeah you, somebody has written one manuscript on top of an earlier one, but parts of the earlier one are still showing through, right? So underneath the kind of the obviously legible magical symbol on each of children Mrs. Cards is a much more mundane text, right? It's underwritten by, you know, stuff, you know, that talks about the just the, the ordinary facts of life, right? You know, an alehouse bill or a laundry list or things like that. Now the other weird thing that occurs here that I want to point you to, and we're gonna stop here because this is gonna to point to future things. We'll talk about Lady Pole and her issues next time. What happens when Childermas is trying to tell Norrell's fortune for Vinculus and he draws the Emperor card? So look on page 202, right? So children have shuffled the cards, and Vinculus took nine and laid them out. Then he turned over the first card, four, the emperor. It showed a king seated upon a throne in the open air with all the customary kingly accoutrements of crown and scepter. Children must lean forward and examined it. What is it? asked Vinculus. I do not seem to have copied this card very well. I never noticed before. The inking is very badly done. The lines are thick and smudged that the emperor's hair and robe appear almost black and someone has left a dirty thumbprint over the eagle. The emperor should be an older man than this. I have drawn a young man. Are you going to hazard an interpretation? No, said Vinculus, and indicated by a contemptuous thrust of his chin that children should turn the next card. Four, the emperor. There was a short silence. That is not possible, said children. There are not two emperors in this pack. I know there are not. If anything, the king was younger and fiercer than before. His hair and robes were black, and the crown upon his head had become a thin band of pale metal. There was no trace of the thumbprint upon the card, but the great bird in the corner was now decidedly black, and it had cast off its eagle-like aspects and settled into a shape altogether more English. It had become a raven. Children has turned over the third card, four, the emperor, and the fourth, four, the emperor. By the fifth, the number and name of the card had disappeared, but the picture remained the same. A young, dark-haired king at whose feet strutted a great black bird. Children has turned over each and every card. He even examined the remainder of the pack, but in his anxiety to see, he fumbled and the cards somehow fell everywhere. Black kings crowded about children as spinning in the cold gray air. Upon each card was the same figure with the same pale, unforgiving gaze. There, said Vingulus softly. This is what you may tell the magician of Hanover Square. That is his past and his present and his future. So what's the thing that's happened here that shouldn't have happened? Multiple, multiple emperor cards. Yeah. With the Every card he draws is incrementally, it's all the same card, right? It's all the emperor card, which shouldn't happen. There should be only one card in the deck. But over, like, as he draws them, they become more and more like the image of the Raven King. Right? So Vinculus is a charlatan, right? He shouldn't be able to do this kind of thing. But there's something happening here that Childermas doesn't understand. But that Vinculus, who has who's the guy who gives the Raven the, the Raven King's prophecy to Norrell, does seem to have maybe some inkling of, right? Or have something to do with. So I want you to kind of sit on that for next time. 
and we'll pick up the Lady Pole stuff uh, when we begin on Wednesday. Um, so we are out of time. Um, I wrote down the guide questions, uh, but I didn't upload them onto my thumb drive, so I'll email those to you um, when I get back to my office in three minutes. What chapter were we supposed to read to? Because I think my book is Okay, your, your page numbers might be a little different. Yeah, because I read to page 222, and it just so happened to end up like a chapter. So I read to chapter 20, but I definitely was not where you guys were talking about. Okay. What chapter did you guys read to? Uh, it was up to chapter 22. Okay. So then what chapter does that end? Okay, so so this because I can just read twenty two. Yes. Whatever. So this will end at chapter um, chapter thirty six is the last chapter you will read. All the okay. mirrors of the world. Okay.